Hello viewers, welcome back to the lab. Um, in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at this wonderful old PC. Now, this is not a normal PC. Um, it's a bit unusual. It dates from um, about 1998, 1999, um, and it was used in a very specialized environment. So I think you might find this video interesting. Now, uh, this is an absolute tank of a machine. Um, it is uh, what is that? Five, five U high rack unit, and it goes all the way back over here. Um, it's absolutely enormous, weighs about 20 kilos. It is not your normal PC. It's not something you would have had at home. This is where it's going to get a bit more complicated. Um, the actual machine itself is manufactured by Intergraph. Intergraph were a, um, a reasonably sized um, PC graphics company um, um, in the 90s and noughties. Um, they built PCs um, for doing graphics. So that would have been anything, literally. Um, so it could have been painting, it could have been um, 3D graphics rendering and all that sort of stuff. So they had their own um, video cards, they made their own hardware. Um, it was um, quite a big operation. So this is manufactured by them. Um, this would have been um, like an off-the-shelf um, turnkey kind of uh, solution that a, another company would buy um, and then turn into something else. And that's what this is. So the, the actual machine itself is an Intergraph Studio Z um, system. It's quite a cut down one because it, it does a quite a specialized job. This was a product of the 5D company. Um, they were a British company um, who supplied these sort of systems as part of a, a plug-in solution um, to accelerating uh, graphics plugins. So that might be on various systems. Um, so they could be on 3D software, Photoshop, possibly. I'm not 100% sure on that one. But also they did plugins for Quantel machines. Um, and that's what this machine is. This is a piece of hardware that you would have had alongside your Quantel um, Edit Box or a Quantel Henry or the Quantel HAL, the three top systems from uh, Quantel. Uh, you could have bought one of these systems, installed the plugins on the Quantel machine, and when you used those plugins, all the rendering was done on here. Um, so this was a separate box which allowed the Quantel machine to offload um, a load of the processing onto another piece of hardware while you can still keep using the Quantel doing editing and other uh, things like that. Um, this allows you to have a machine that can just churn away in the background processing a load of effects on um, a video while you're still working on the Quantel. But at the end of the day, this is a PC. Um, it is also, we think, fully working. Um, I can't actually test this <laughs> because um, I don't have a working Henry, a working edit box, or a working HAL. I'm able to power this up into a state which would be fully ready uh, for it to be tested um, on a Quantel machine, but I just need to have one. So hopefully in the future I can uh, meet up with somebody and we can hopefully plug this into their Quantel and see what it actually can do. So before I rearrange the camera, I just want to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. This episode of Dexter's Tech Lab has been sponsored by PCBWay, your one-stop solution for PCB prototyping, PCB assembly, and this is not just normal PCBs. You can do flex, flex rigid, all this sort of stuff. They also offer 3D printing, CNC machining and milling, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding. So tons and tons of options there for turning your current project into reality. So before we get into the nitty gritty of this, let's give you a tour around this. So a PC from the 90s. So this is actually a dual Pentium 3. Um, as you can see, it's mounted in this rather large 19 inch rack. Um, it's, what, what would that be, 5U five, five high, and we have a, uh, an area for discs, um, these are just JBOD discs, so they're just um, discs that are just raided together. All the usual stuff, floppy drive, CD-ROM drive, um, etc. 
So, uh, taking a look around at the back, um, we can see that um, this is a standard ATX form factor. We've got the back plane there and the, uh, the space for the cards to go in just there. So, not a huge amount to see. There's a few things I'm going to pick up though. There's a couple of stickers here, um, Edit 5, um, that was actually also on the front of the box. And we have a, an asset sticker here as well. So um, that says Yorkshire Time Teased uh, Television, um, and it's got the logos um, and an asset number. So this came from uh, Yorkshire TV. Um, in terms of the ports on the back, uh, as I said, this is pretty standard um, ATX form factor stuff. So we've got PS2 style keyboard and mouse. Uh, we have two serial ports. We've got a game port. Um, we've got audio inputs and outputs and two USBs and Ethernet. And above that we have the regular um, power supply just there. And then in the card cage area we have um, a VGA output just here. So the card at the end is the one that provides all the video inputs and outputs. Now the way this connected to your Quantel was through um, SDI, which is a broadcast video standard. Um, used from the early 90s um, and it's still in use today. Composite video out, um, that is YC video out, then SDI out, SDI in, and then the SDI reference. Now we do have a couple of interesting stickers uh, on the back here. I'll just read them out to you. Um, it says here, please do not attach a mouse to the mouse port. Only attach a keyboard to the keyboard port when using uh, the emergency recovery CD as described in the ERCD usage note. Failure to comply may cause system malfunctions and may void your warranty. And there's a, a similar one just here. Um, it says, please do not attach a monitor to the SVGA port. This port should only be used by Intergraph Computer Systems field service engineers while servicing the equipment. Failure to comply may cause system malfunctions and may void your warranty. So, yeah, some pretty stern warnings there. Um, so, it's quite obvious from, from those that this um, machine is designed to be installed. Um, and you would not have a monitor or keyboard attached to this. You literally, it's just a box. You turn it on at the front, um, and after a period of time, it boots up and does its thing, um, and that's it. You have no more interaction with it. So, uh, obviously, we want to see inside, so uh, let's give you a view inside the actual machine. The lid uh, just slides off. It's quite heavy because it's all big, thick sheets of steel. So we can see the motherboard in the back. That is fairly large, um, covers the entire area over there. Uh, power supply, um, you can, should just be able to see the two CPUs um, down in there. Don't worry, we'll be looking at all this in a little bit more detail in just a moment. We have the boot hard disk just there, and then we have a cage um, with the, the JBOD drives, the RAID drives in. I should say this is actually quite a nice um, case to work on. It has been pretty well designed. For example, there's some fans just here uh, and they can just be pulled out um, once you've disconnected the wire. These can just be pulled out and yeah, it's things like that which, you know, back in the 90s, um, we were only just starting to think about things like that for making it easy to service things uh, on um, computers like this. Looking at the extreme front, um, this part of the case can also be unscrewed. There's two thumb screws here, uh, and then the front will actually tilt down um, to give you access to remove um, the drives and generally get into it. Um, there's some interesting um, features. For example, this bar here, which you just unscrew and it releases the thing, so you can then remove um, the various drives out so it, uh, it has been pretty well thought about so i've just removed the power supply so you can get a better idea um, and a better view of the actual motherboard so the motherboard was designed by intergraph um, it's not a, a bought-in one so it's their own design um, specifically designed for doing video and graphics and that kind of thing so uh, they've probably optimised the performance a bit. 
In terms of the built-in features on the motherboard, uh, we have uh, all the usual suspects, you know, the serial ports, parallel ports, USB audio. We have uh, two 68-pin uh, SCSI channels, um, which are just here and here. Um, and there is another channel as well, which is a, um, a single-ended channel. So there is actually a total of three SCSI controllers um, on, on this. So there's actually quite a lot of option when it comes to adding um, drives onto this. Uh, we have the two CPUs over at the back. Uh, those are Pentium 3, 500 megahertz. Interesting way they have the different heat sinks on here and there's a, a ducted fan to blow over them. So clearly these are, are BGA devices. They're very, very thin. Um, I mean, very unusual packaging. Um, yeah, never seen anything like that before. In terms of expansion ports, we have an AGP port here with a Matrox G200 um, plugged into it. As I said before, this wouldn't have been used for um, user interaction. This was literally just there uh, for uh, people to come along and service it when um, there was a problem. We have a total of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven PCI ports. And then we have the large card sat in the back, which does the um, digital video. So clearly this is a very nice looking uh, video input and output card. Um, this is, as I said, designed by Intergraph themselves. The part number is MSMT491, and it's revision zero. Uh, YC video, uh, composite video, SDI in, SDI out, and uh, that's the reference. So this can play back and record standard definition um, SDI video, uh, which is uncompressed. So that is 270 megabits per second. Um, this also does appear to have what might be an optional card um, attached to this. And this is a, a um, MJPEG compression board. Um, so in addition to being able to record in um, uncompressed form, you can actually have, you can actually compress it as well. But I don't believe um, it's used in this situation. Um, this machine only ever records um, uncompressed video. Now, before I put the lid back on this, um, I'm just going to detail what I did to get this working. The first thing I did was I checked the power supply. Um, that all seemed to be fine. Nothing went bang. Um, all the voltage was fine. So I powered up the system with the discs disconnected. It literally just powered on, no post beeps or anything. So what I did, I went in and unplugged the two CPUs, the memory, all the cards, um, made sure the connectors were clean and plugged those back in. That fixed that issue and I could hear it posting. Um, so I could also hear it spinning up the discs because I, I did try plugging the discs in. But there was no video at all. Now, uh, this is actually running a, a Matrox G200. Even back in the day, they were known to be a bit flaky when it came to their BIOS. You basically could get no video output and that's what seemed to be happening with this so thankfully there are tools and utilities out there and i was able to um, boot off a floppy disk and it reflashes the bios and then it all just works and that's what i did and that was it um, only two complete failures i had um, this is the the fan which is for the cpu um, so it just lives on a behind behind that um, metal ducting just there. Um, this had completely failed. Um, I thought initially it had just seized up because it was very, very stiff, but um, I did uh, disassemble it and um, re-lubed it and uh, it spins freely, but it just doesn't run at all. So that had to be swapped out and changed. Thankfully it was all relatively easy because it's just using you know regular PC parts. About a week after I got this running was the uh, system disk. Um, so this was the original one that was installed. It's a Seagate uh, medalist. As you can see, it's got the original Intergraph sticker on. It, um, it was initially fine, but after a week of me sort of tinkering around with this, um, all of a sudden it just started uh, making loud knocking noises and it uh, died fairly quickly. But uh, thankfully I'd, I'd already had made a, a complete image of the entire disk. Um, and I just wrote that onto a, uh, a replacement disc that I found in the lab um, and slotted that in. And that seemed to be working just fine. Uh, 
Now, while we're on the subject of discs, uh, I will show you the the JBOD discs. Um, so these live at the front. Let's just extract one out. Um, so these are specifically AV discs. So they are designed to be used in an audio visual environment. So they don't do much in the way of thermal recalibrations, uh, things like that. Now, it's the sort of thing which can cause problems when you're trying to stream huge amounts of video onto a disc. All of a sudden the disc goes like, hang on, I can't do anything because I'm doing a thermal recalibration. Uh, so these are AV drives which, are, um, which prevent that from being a problem. So these are SCSI um, SCA devices. So these are nine gigabytes each and they are striped um, to improve the performance. So there's a, they're set up in a RAID configuration. So as you can see, we're all up and running and um, it's fairly obvious that this is running Windows NT. There's a couple of interesting things. Firstly, there's no login. Um, that has been disabled. So whenever you power this up, it just goes straight into um, what I think this is actually the ad admin user uh, with no password or anything um, and runs up the uh, 5D software. Um, stickers that were, we found on the back of the machine saying do not plug a mouse into this do not plug a keyboard in uh, and all that sort of stuff was because this is actually it just logs straight in so if some if you had some random mouse or keyboard plugged in you could possibly click something by accident um, type something by accident and it would just the system would just respond to it so putting those warning stickers on the back is probably a way to say uh, don't plug anything in because you might end up, um, yeah, moving the mouse around and deleting things or um, closing the program. So another thing that's interesting is you might have seen when it booted up that um, you saw a format command. So what that is actually doing is formatting the um, RAID disks, which is where all the video is stored. So again, whenever this is turned on, it quite clearly wipes um, any of the files that were on those video disks. So we have a couple of programs running. Uh, one is called Serial Diagnostics and the other is um, ORE Control System. Um, so we can see uh, 5D Monster Masher uh, with the Intergraph SDI option um, version 1.1 December the 7th 1999 5D Limited. So this is the main um, listener to receive um, 
commands from the Quantel machine. Now, uh, these commands come in over the network. So when you're using the plugins on the Quantel machine, you're actually sending network commands to this machine for it to do whatever it needs to do. The way this uh, we think this might work, on the Quantel machine, you have Java applets. Um, you have a Java applet for each type of effect that the uh, masher can actually perform. And uh, you would set up the effect in the little Java applet that which runs on the Quantel. Um, and then when you say go um, and, and ask the machine to process it, um, it plays out the source footage over the SDI, which is then recorded by the masher onto the uh, RAID disks. Um, and then uh, there's an application on here which then does all the processing. And presumably, there is also some kind of acknowledgement back to the Quantel machine to say, hey, that, that job is now finished, you can um, download it back onto the Quantel machine. There was a, a lot more competition coming in from PCs at the time. Photoshop, After Effects, and you could get buy plugins that did all, lots of different effects, and Quantel didn't really have that, which is why they started uh, teaming up with people like 5D um, to be able to offer those kinds of solutions. So we have the ORE control system. So this is the network listener, uh, which looks out for packets coming from the Quantel to, um, to actually render video. Um, and we've got serial diagnostics as well. There is actually um, a, a serial diagnostics menu. So let's just close these down. Um, and I'll show you the files that are actually on the disk. Um, so we've got video disks. These are the two 9 gig drives which are raided together to give you your bandwidth. Um, so they're blank because, as you noticed, it got formatted. Uh, page disk is a separate partition um, just for the page file. Um, we've got the we have the CD drive and C. Uh, so in here, this is pretty much uh, a very, very bland install of Windows NT workstation. One folder here called Masher, uh, but before that, let's just go into um, the Studio Z Burst um, section. So this is the drivers which um, support the Studio Z uh, video capture card that's, that's in this. So there's a little control panel where it's all pretty basic stuff. Um, so that is that. Um, the actual masher side, you can see here um, in this folder we have a number of files. We've got the programs that were loaded up when the system booted, version.dat, we've got some DLLs. So in here in jars we have a number of jar files and that, those are Java files. How they relate to the Java applets which are on the Quantel machine and what they are doing on here, uh, on this machine, I don't know. Um, as I said, until we can actually get this up and running with a Quantel machine, we don't really know how all this works. Um, licenses, um, so we've got um, some license information. So what it looks like is when this is installed, it actually has its it's actually tied to a particular Quantel machine. So host ID, Quantel serial, uh, 15984. Uh, Quantel machines often had um, five digit serial numbers and that sounds very much like it's a, um, a, a serial number from a Quantel Henry or a Hal or something like that. Um, so there's quite clearly some licensing information there which ties this masher to a particular uh, Quantel machine, that's kind of interesting. Um, pics, there's a couple of pictures on here in some weird format um, and I can't read those. Uh, Plugin, um, these are, I think are all the DLLs which actually do the um, actual video rendering. So you can see there's one of these for each of the different effects that the machine can do. Okay, so uh, we're just going to take a look at the um, diagnostic serial um, console thing that uh, 
you saw the app running in Windows. Uh, so I'm just going to connect my PC. So now we should, there we are, have the serial console. Um, so as I have played around with this before, so I do know you can just do question mark to get help. Uh, so we've got a small menu here. Okay. Uh, show license information, network statistics. And we've got some commands to set uh, various things. So IP address, net card name, gateway, all the TCP IP networking stuff. Oh, interactive for normal operation set to ORE mode. If interactive mode is a monitor, um, keyboard and mouse must be attached to the ORE warning. End users must not set interactive mode. Page length. Oh, okay, yeah. Ping. Test disks. Run external command. Process name. Kill the ORE masher process. Install updated versions of ORE software elements. So, yeah, it does very much look like this um, would have been used without a keyboard or monitor and. Um, Presumably, and possibly an end user might even be able to upgrade the software by just connecting to this diagnostics console, um, pop a CD into the drive, and it would update itself. So, okay, so we've got some IP addresses. Now, these um, I have actually already been changing because I was sort of, um, I was kind of wondering whether I might have been able to play with some of the, um, I might have been able to get Java working on my paint box. Um, and try and talk to it, even though I wouldn't be able to do effects. But um, I can't run Java on my paint box, so it's not supported. So that's why that is set to uh, some of my internal IP addresses. Um, show EV. Uh, that is just pulling um, events out of the Windows system event log. So probably not really a lot to see in there. Um, Show DI. So yeah, they're just the volumes that are currently mounted. Yeah, that's just the various um, processes that are running on the entire machine. Oh. Yeah. Auto admin logon is enabled. The default username administrator. So. That answers that earlier question that um, it is logging in as administrator. Um, that's interesting. We have machine serial number. The licenses, and that looks like it's the contents of that text file that we saw earlier. normal network information, serial port information, and the rest of the commands are set commands, so it allows you to set the IP and things like that. Um, IP address, netmask, gateway, boot info. Um, I'm not going to try this interactive mode here, I might experiment with that off camera. Uh, we've got a test um, facility here, um, which tests the SDI port. This I have done off camera already, and um, what it does, um, you connect an SDI signal into the machine, and you do um, TESD PAL, and it'll grab one single frame and display it as hex text in the the console. Um, and it does look like it's valid data, so it looks like that um, video input and output card is working. Um, run external command, I'm pretty certain this is just running um, a Windows command. So, undo command. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's broke it. 
Um, yeah, so that's just going to run a, an external command. So I think pr that pretty much wraps up uh, this feature on the 5D Masher. Um, very, very interesting bit of kit uh, from the uh, late 1990s, early noughties. Now, there's a few uh, questions raised uh, in the video, I suppose. Um, can we get this working? Um, I think so. If we can get a working HAL and edit box or a Henry um, or uh, one of the later paint boxes like the Paintbox FX, um, things like that, I think we should be able to get this running. In terms of the licensing, there has already been a little bit of work in the community um, about trying to um, have this work on a different Quantel machine than it was originally intended for, which is great because um, obviously support for all this sort of stuff has now disappeared. Um, and without being able to use this on another machine, it's just a brick. So it would be nice to be able to um, have this up and running um, and being able to demonstrate how the workflows of the late 90s would have worked in terms of video production. Uh, there is another question that is that comes up as well, and could this be virtualized? Given that it's just a Windows NT machine um, which runs some software, um, could this potentially be virtualized? There, there is always the issue of the video input and output, um, but um, yeah, I don't see any reason why the software wouldn't run on um, a virtual system. So. That raises some interesting, <laughs> interesting options. Um, maybe the uh, video input output card could be um, converted from PCI um, onto PCIe, and then that can go into a new piece of hardware. That's another possibility. There's all sorts of little things that could be done with this machine. So I'm pretty certain there's going to be more features on this um, as time goes on, but for the moment, um, it's going to get uh, packed away and um, stored. Now I know it's all working. Um, I can bring it out when the opportunity arises. And in case you're wondering, I have absolutely no idea how much this would have cost. The only indication I have is a base model Studio Z system from uh, Intergraph um, would have been about $40,000. But that would have been this box with a lot of extra hardware in it. Uh, there would have been a 3D video card and all sorts of things in it. So uh, it's hard to create some kind of price. Um, obviously, these were bought in by the by 5D with the, the capture card. Um, they put their software on and then resold it. So yeah, uh, if, if anybody knows or remembers using um, a 5D masher, um, on their Quantel system. I'd be very interested to know your experiences using it. Was it uh, worth the extra money to purchase one of these to, to work with the Quantel? Did it work really well? Was it, was it a bit flaky? So I think that pretty much concludes this video. Um, I just want to thank um, PCBWay for sponsoring this episode and of course my loyal patrons who continue to support me. Uh, thank you very, very much. If you want to be a patron, uh, there will be links in the video description. Okay, thanks very much for watching everybody and I'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.